The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave. Welcome to Postcards, I'm Dana Johnson. This week we're taking a look at the historically significant collections of three local collectors. We'll see what these collections can tell us about our history and what we can learn about the people that left these unique items behind. First we'll travel to Clinton, Minnesota to join Steve Meisner as he showcases a historic piano collection dating back to the 17th century. Uh, the piano has been described as an American perfection of a French improvement based on an English adaptation of a German version of an Italian invention. I started collecting when I was a young man. I would have been, oh, 10 or 11 years old. Uh, the first piano I picked up was a player piano when I was about 15 and it kind of went on from there. I bought it at an auction sale and um, it, it now has turned into this big collection of stuff 30 some years later. Of course some of them are come from Europe and a lot of places here in the United States. I have instruments I think from eight different countries. Um, people have uh, donated stuff to me. I've actually had to pay, write a check for some of these instruments. I've had to pay for a few of them. Uh, and they, they show up. People are now learning that I'm doing this and are actually bringing stuff to me and because uh, they're all excited about what's happening with this. Well, the Big Stone Arts Council has been uh, promoting art in the Big Stone Lake area uh, for quite a while. Steve Meisner's piano exhibit was mentioned to me by a mutual friend and we had a wonderful conversation on the telephone and I thought this is exactly what we need. This is a wonderful uh, exhibit to participate and share with the community. Uh, many of these have never been seen before. Uh, some of these are the first time Steve has ever exhibited so and some of these are very very rare. The Smithsonian has a, a, one of the largest collections probably in the United States and uh, they have a, a lot of their instruments now on their, their website and so I was able to dig through and see what they have and I, I think I came up with about 20 instruments that I have that they have comparable instruments to or in some cases actually I, I have better examples than what the Smithsonian has. For example, I have uh, three instruments at home that I didn't even bring that I have, I am the owner of the only known example of that particular make of piano. What impresses me the most about this collection is that it's here. Um, I mean, many of these are, are, are uh, musical orphans, and the fact that someone such as Steve has taken upon himself to um, restore and maintain and exhibit these pieces, um, sharing this with the community is just amazing. What I think is important about it is that it brings a light to light a lot of things. Um, history of music, certainly. Uh, history of our culture, because uh, there were times there was a piano in every home. Um, 
history of technology as this instrument developed into being the instrument that it is today, um, history of woodworking because these things have some incredible woodworking skill that would have gone into some of that also. There's several that are amazingly ornamental. Certainly part of the, the, the design features of these instruments would have been design styles of the day, furniture styles of the day. The, the, the um, uh, Victorian area would have had very big, gaudy type scroll work legs that would have been part of that furniture style. Uh, there would have been a lot of hand work done, a lot of these legs and stuff on the older instruments are hand carved and so you know you will see imperfections in the legs because of that. Uh, as the technology developed they would have developed tools and jigs and stuff to have made a little more mass assembly line on legs by 1900. There would have been some of that already happening. One of the major things that would have developed in the technology would have been a cast iron plate. Uh, the older instruments that I have here do not have a cast iron plate in them. Uh, that would have added a lot more structure to the piano. By having a cast iron plate, kind of like a bone structure of a human, uh, they were able to add more strings to the piano. They were able to add more notes to it, uh, put those strings at a higher tension, so we had a little more brilliant sound out of those instruments. But of course, it added significantly in weight. The older instruments were 61 notes and they would get a few more notes as, as they were able to find ways of adding to the, to the structure of the instrument. Today, of course, pianos are standard 88 notes. The piano has a lot of uh, different materials in it. I mentioned the cast iron plate earlier, so there's the cast iron in it. Uh, the woods are going to be, uh, the soundboard wood is going to be spruce and depending on Europe or America, the type of spruce that was used in them. And that's the same wood that was used in violins and acoustic guitars, that real straight grained wood. Uh, the, the structure of the piano, because it needed to hold tension, uh, would be lower grades of oak, maple, and so those kinds of things. Uh, the, the cabinetry of the piano, most all of them are made with veneer, and so a lot of times, particularly during the Victorian area, era, there would have been, uh, rosewood would have been the veneer of choice at that time, and that's a real exotic wood, uh, real beautiful wood, and so that would have been the, what they would have used for the cabinetry. I think just about all of them have ivory keys, and so that, of course, is now a thing of the past. Uh, most of the keys are made with perlin or plastic today, and, and that would be within the last 60 years or so. This upright that is behind me, the uh, Jacob doll with the marquetry design, that one is a pretty unique design for, for cabinetry. Um, the little John Broadwood is very unique because of its age and because it will play. Um, so, uh, there's an Arard over here that has a brass decal on it that would have been carved brass and laid into the wood. I don't know how they were able to put that together. So uh, there's another piano here that has what's called a concave keyboard. The keyboard isn't straight. It's curved like the pedals on an on a organ are. And so that's a unique feature about that one. So yeah, and there's a number of them here that have um, hand carved legs and those kinds of details. And that's kind of interesting too. So a lot of them have, there's a lot of different things here that are unique. Some of the things that were involved in putting these pianos together, one, I was just overwhelmed when I looked at the big truck coming in. It's like, wow, what's this? Um, and everything was packed up so Im Im amazingly uh, tight and concise and coming those, bringing them off the truck, um, unwrapping them, and and then setting them out in a place where uh, Steve had already decided where these were all going, it, it was a really smooth process. This would be the fourth time I've done this, so um, it, it goes a little better every time. I, I get a little more equipment put together. I've had guys that have helped me for years, and uh, they seem to enjoy it. Every time I ask if they can, they're always willing to help. I think part of it is that we, we don't in a sense, Gorilla move these pianos. There's a system to doing it. We never lift a deadlift a piano ever. You know, there's just a way of doing it that makes it go very well, and, and, and it just goes, and I think they enjoy doing some of that stuff. We all were working on one piano at a time to uh, unwrap the piano, take away the, um, the uh, wrappings, and to put, find all the pieces. It's like, how do you keep these pieces together? 
It was incredibly organized and it was a lot of fun putting all those pieces together, screwing the legs on, putting the pedals on the pieces. The legs are numbered, um, so it's going through to, to figure out which number goes which with, with, with which piano um, makes that a little bit of a, sometimes to dig through because as these instruments were moved over the last hundred years, people would sometimes renumber them or write their own numbers in pencil or something. So we would try to go with what the factory would do and a lot of times they would do a, a, a punch into the leg with a chisel and do a tally or something to, to give some information on which legs go where. My hope is that this exhibit will encourage people to come and um, see this wonderful exhibit of musical instruments that is really unusual, very unique. One of my goals has always been, uh, I chuckle about this when I say it, is that if I can entice a dozen kids to stay with piano lessons one more year, then the trip was worth, worth the travel, worth loading, moving the pianos for. I think anyone coming here is going to be really uh, enthralled and trance and come back with other friends. It should be a, a great ex month long exhibit. So it's been really hard for me to, to try to describe what this is. And uh, because it's a lot of things, it's, 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 there's, a, there's a lot to it, and, and I find that to be very intriguing. And I, and I hope that that will be something that, that people will enjoy and people would, would find it worthwhile to come and see. Now, we'll catch up with John Lindstrand, who shares with us his wide array of war memorabilia in a collection which pays ode to the men and women who served our country. John Lindstrand, I'm the operator of USMHC, United States Military Historical Collection. I've set up the Veterans Day Observance, bring in a collection of over 5,000 military items from the Civil War up to modern day, open it up to the public over Veterans Day and give them a chance to see some of the real items of military history and let the school kids and others get a chance to talk to some of the veterans that use these items. We set up the, the event with uh, three days, try to do two days during the week, and that allows us a chance to get multiple schools in here for the display and the event. We'll have between anywhere between five to 800 school kids, depending on what schools can do each year. They'll come in, they'll get a chance to, during the days, they'll see the items on display, talk to the veterans. They help answer the questions uh, for the people that come through, let them know if somebody's looking at something, don't know what it is, they can a lot of times tell them what it is. But it also to help share those stories, that history. Um, a lot of them are, are very willing and able to, to take that little item and be able to use that into a story to help share that, that experience and help people understand better um, what, what our veterans went through. We need to be able to pass on these stories and that history to those other generations. If they don't get that chance to hear it, and especially hearing it direct from the source, history tends to get skewed over the years, so it's really nice to be able to get that info out direct from those who were there and had that chance to, to live that and give it a chance to go from generation to generation that way. I've been bringing classes here for five years now. As part of, uh, I teach a class on World War II and the Holocaust, as well as my AP U.S. History students. Well, it gives a great perspective into some of the sacrifice and, and again, just the conditions that these men went through to show them the World War I uniform that's wool and heavy and hot. And then they go all the way up to the, over with the uh, Desert Storm Air veterans and they get to try on a flak vest, see how heavy it is, and a Kevlar helmet and to, to feel and touch and the, the smell inside the GP Medium tent kind of gives a real, you know, real world feel to it. It's not just something in a history book. It's there. It's real. You can touch it. I hope they realize a certain degree of the realities of military service slash war and realize that it isn't anything like a video game or a movie or anything else is going to portray it. The other thing is I hope they realize how much we owe our vets. Um, what we take for granted every day, just the little things that we have that uh, 
if it wasn't for them fighting and preserving that freedom, you know, we wouldn't have. So I, I hope that they can walk away understanding that a little better too. Most of what you see in here is items that have been donated either by the veteran or the veteran's family. Stuff sits in a cedar chest or whatever for so many years and they just know that the history is being lost. So they decide they want to just bring that in and try to give a chance to, to share that with the public. And even if it's just three days a year, it's better than sitting in a cedar chest. So that's where we were able to get that history, those pictures, all that to go along with the item. Well, this is basically my first item that ever came into the collection. Um, this is a World War II Army helmet liner. It was given to me by a neighbor when I was growing up, when I was about five years old. They were getting ready to move, and he just was compiled a box of stuff and knew I liked military-like things, so he called me up, and I went down there and picked it up, and this is the item that started it all. Um, Arden was uh, in the Army, got all through his training, started to head over towards the East Coast to get ready to head over to the European War. Before they got there, the war ended, so they got on trucks and or trains and hauled them all back to the West Coast to get on boats to go to the Pacific, and got about a week out in the Pacific, and then the, the Pacific War ended. So he ended up spending the rest of his military time at the Philippines when he finally got out into the Pacific. But he never did see combat, but uh, he was the key instigator of this entire collection. This, this display is set up showing uh, three generations of the same family that had served in the military. Adolf, who was in World War I, Merlin, who was in World War II, and then Bob, who served in Vietnam. Now, one thing that's interesting about this is we have Merlin's wife's wedding dress. Now, Merlin served as a paratrooper during World War II, and during World War II, silk was rationed, so it couldn't be got to make the dress. So after one of his jumps, he sent the parachute home, and that's what made the wedding dress. It was one of his original World War II Army issue parachutes. And then, of course, the bridesmaid dress that just completes the whole package. It's a great, interesting history, and, and something that was kind of common, but nobody really thinks about. You know, the display is very much of a living, breathing thing when it's identified by the individuals who used it and some of their stories in that history. I find it fascinating to hear what they've gone through, to, to think about the stuff that they, they did, more or less for me, for me, my kids to be able to grow up free. I mean, I'm a strong believer in the veterans are what helps keep us free. And uh, being able to take that history, help preserve it, keep it alive, and let them know that they're very much appreciated for everything that they've done for us. And that's, that's really kind of one of my guiding focuses on this whole thing, is to be able to preserve that history and share it just to keep their tradition and legacy alive. Next, we'll take a boat ride with Paul Michelson, who's preparing to close the chapter on his one-of-a-kind collection of Falls Flyers. We'll get a last peek at this extraordinary collection as a whole before he auctions it off in May of 2012. Today we are in the Michelson Collection Classic Boat Museum in Wilmer, Minnesota. And it's my retirement hobby uh, and my collection of classic boats, toy boats, trains, duck decoys and the like. And uh, I'm preparing for an auction that will be coming up in May to sell my collection as I retire. This room is the main room of my classic boat museum and houses my fantastic Larson Falls Flyer collection. Uh, there are other boats in the collection, but I've outgrown the space. So this, these are the rarest and uh, the most favored ones in my collection. Uh, and this was the heart of my museum. I retired and moved out to the lake and uh, started collecting so that I'd have a purpose, something to do during the day. And uh, it became this. Uh, I don't know how it ever got to this, but it did. And 
I enjoyed collecting, and the fun, of course, was in the hunt, is to find the things that were very desirable and that I could afford and put together this museum, and I was a one-man band, so I worked here alone. And it gave me a place to be and a purpose and a goal or objective. And I went to boat shows and collected friends all over the country. That was great fun, and they're still my close friends today. The uh, two boats that are directly in front of me here are Larson Falls Flyers from 1939 and 1941. Uh, they're cedar strip construction with a canvas skin, and both of these are outboards. The unique feature about these two is they're consecutively serial numbered. The one nearest me is serial number 4172, and the one next to it is 4173. And of the eight of these boats that exist, these are the only two that are consecutively serial numbered. The name of this boat is Flight of Fancy, and it once again it relates to Charles Lindbergh's uh, airplane, and he was the Falls Flyer, and that's why I named it Flight of Fancy after we finished the restoration. It's the largest Falls Flyer inboard ever built. There were only three of them documented. This one is 21 feet in length and has a 140 horse gray fireball uh, engine. Uh, it's a twin cockpit forward, which means it has a cockpit here and a cockpit here with a rear engine. The interior is Philippine mahogany and uh, we took it all out, put 17 coats of hand rubbed varnish on it and put it back in so it's all original. This is the only one known that's still all original. The cutwater on the inboard Falls Flyers was a wing, and that again was intended to bring the theme of flight to the Falls Flyer boat. You'll notice that these are all uh, pre-war Falls Flyers. Now after the war, this is a post-war false flyer, and the bow fixture now is a goose, and that was distinctive for the false flyers that were built after the war. My museum was a passion for me, and uh, it was a goal or objective to help build a museum that was Im of import to classic boat collectors and motor collectors and the like, and I found it very enjoyable and it was purposeful because I had a goal or objective to get to and uh, it, it turned into something much bigger than I ever dreamed. By 1956, the Falls Flyers were hand-laid fiberglass. They still had a lot of wood in them, the dashboard and the uh, covering boards and the seat bottoms and backs. Uh, so well, I think hobbies are fabulous for people, not just my hobby. These were my hobbies, but other people should have a hobby. I think they're wonderful for, for people, especially when they retire. I didn't want to sit in an easy chair and then have people send flowers. This is a 1956 Falls Flyer with the engine hood, and this is my original Falls Flyer that I bought when I was a senior in high school here in Wilmer. And it's a hand-laid fiberglass with a 25 or a 30 horse Johnson Javelin outboard motor. That's the original motor for the boat. The boat is all original. It has been restored. Featured in my museum is my collection of outboard motors. Some are very rare and unique. All are in pristine condition. Uh, the ones that appear in the museum. I do have a storage building full of outboard motors that will be sold on uh, the first day of the auction on the 18th. Some of the unique motors that will be available are a Johnson sausage tank outboard. Here's a Thor streamliner, an interesting motor because Thor company was bought by Carl Kikafer in order to start the Mercury Motor Company. And the end result is that he had racks and racks and racks of these little Thor motors that didn't sell. He designed this shroud and renamed it the Soar Streamliner and they sold like hotcakes. So it's a very unique motor. 
and just by changing the shroud, they made them a very collectible. This is a Menominee Submerged Electric, 1903, built in Menominee, Wisconsin, and it's an indication of the rarity of some of the motors that are in the collection. Uh, they had built false flyers for about 19 years now, and the uh, Larson decided that it was time for a change, and they built the finned flyer, which was only built in 1958, 59, and 60, and this was the first molded false flyer. Uh, it copied the automotive industry by having fins, tail lights, armrests, a glove box, speedometer, and turn signals and it was a, a unique boat and a, a fabulous operator. Uh, their claim was that it danced on the waves like a ballerina. Thank you for your call. I appreciate it very much and I wish we were open. Yeah, well, so am I. Well, thank you. All right, all right, bye-bye. I enjoyed it very much and now it's just time to turn a new leaf in my life and move on. That's all for now. For more information, go to our website. Hope to see you again on Postcards. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota, shalomhillfarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explorealex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave.